All right. Melissa, come on up here. You get in the picture. All right. Well, um, you know, thank you all for coming together for this. You know, um, if you take, have one takeaway from this, from me, um, it's really that in Minnesota, we're ready to provide real solutions to the remaining issues in our health care system, and I remain confident that we will. Um, you know, I think that the recognition that the individual market is in a crisis situation is one that every one of us here um, in the state legislature, regardless of party, is really uh, starting to understand, and we are working together. We're, we need to get through a really difficult political process for the next couple of weeks, but we are ready to come together and provide real solutions. That is the Minnesota way. That is how we have maintained our position as one of the healthiest states in the country over and over, year after year after year. It's by working collaboratively together. So, you know, before we get to some of the things that we've already proposed and some of the proposals that, that you can expect coming up, I, I think it is still important to put a lot of where we are in context. You know, um, the individual market where this volatility occurs, and we take this incredibly seriously, we do think that it needs real solutions, but it needs to be said, and, and the press has been very good about saying it, it represents 5% of where people gain access to health insurance. So. Um, the other 95% of where Minnesotans gain access to health care is actually stabilized. We have employer-sponsored insurance, both large employers, fully insured and self-insured, uh, small group policies, really becoming much more stable. We have public programs that are running much um, better than they ever have in terms of the costs per member per month and uh, improving the quality of the care provided to our public program. So that context is um, incredibly important, and I, and I do appreciate um, the, the press is working with us to make sure that that's mentioned in the stories, because if we lose that, we run the risk of losing the good as we try to fix what still needs some real solutions. So the other things that we've done, we've been able to, you know, through the Affordable Care Act, um, make sure that there's not the ability for insurers to deny people for pre-existing conditions. There's no lifetime limits on the benefits paid. Um, parents are able to keep their kids on their policies to age 26. We have reduced the uninsured to all-time lows. We have 250,000 Minnesotans with insurance today that would not have it but for the reforms that we've done. That can't be lost. Um, to, to 20 million people across the United States have insurance today and access to health care that, that really is a benefit to them and their families that we can't lose sight of. Um, and, and so that with the um, stabilization of much of the health care framework really needs to be part of the context. We just can't throw everything, all the progress that we've made away and turn our entire system over to the feds as some have called for. So again, we need to keep what's working. We need to improve on what needs improvement. So um, uh, a couple of the reasons and the methods that we got here. You know, we started out in Minnesota in calendar 2014, the first year of implementation, with the lowest rates in the country. There was a lot of press around that. Those rates turned out to be unsustainable, to tell you the truth. They didn't reflect the cost of care in this individual market. And that still is something that we're still correcting for. And that, that is a major piece of the volatility that we're still seeing on the price side of the equation. Um, now, with the Blue Cross Blue Shield pullout, I should note, after we left session without a serious proposal coming before the legislature to try to provide a framework in Minnesota that would have allowed them to stay in the individual market. Um, we have another issue on top of price. Their pullout um, precipitated an additional set of rate hikes by the remaining carriers and the placement of caps, enrollment caps, by all of the other players in the market other than Blue Plus, their affiliate. And so now, in addition to uh, a real price issue that we are committed to working on, we also have a real access issue, particularly in greater Minnesota. If you look at the maps from Commerce in greater Minnesota, in most of our counties, there's only two providers. One is Medica, and they have fairly significant caps um, on their product. Uh, at, you know, they have about 43,000 current enrollees that have a, a, you know, a, a reserved place in their caps. 
and they have a total cap of 50,000. I mean, you know, the narrative has to be there's only about room for another 7,000 people statewide. The only other product out there in most of greater Minnesota is the Blue Plus narrow network product that um, unfortunately in many of our regions doesn't cover the, the primary providers in the regions. And so we need to keep our eye on that as well. So one of the things that, that needs to be understood is that when we undertake major reforms of any system, particularly a system as complicated as our healthcare system, it is going to require several years of adjustments and refinements and, and, and fine tuning to make it work. And in Minnesota, unfortunately, we adopted the hyper partisanship that was um, cast in stone at the federal level when the ACA was passed. The ACA is the law of the land. We had to comply, but we had to do it in this hyper partisan context that truthfully didn't help us at all. And we've been stymied at trying to get some real solutions um, uh, through. And now that we are in this situation, I am hearing many of my colleagues coming forward and we're going to work collaboratively together to try to put this together. Now some of my, uh, Senator Sharon and Senator Hayden are going to talk about some of the proposals that we've had. Many of these will come back. Some of these have already been proposed by other legislative caucuses as they've held their press conferences. But in the Senate, we did work on trying to uh, set the framework for a re uh, reinsurance pool. We had um, uh, meaningful discussions about merging the small group and the individual markets. Um, we had additional transparency um, bills to, uh, to provide transparency in the rate setting process for individual market products. We had a uh, buy-in option for Minnesota Care that Senator Sharon was the author of, and she'll speak more to that, I'm sure. We had an expansion of Minnesota Care. Many, most of these came from the recommendations of the Health Care Financing Task Force. And in the Senate, we took almost all of those recommendations, many of them that would have provided the stability for this market. We carried almost all of them into conference committee and they died there. Um, you know, making Minsure more accountable is another one that, that uh, we've carried in the Senate. And now some of the tax credits for people that don't have those subsidies from the feds, I think that um, th that, that idea coming forward from many of our caucuses is one that, you know, the Senate did have hearings on and, and uh, is uh, very interested in pursuing. Um, and with that, you know, I think I'll probably stop with the context and the list of things that have already been considered and uh, turn it over to my colleague, Senator Sharon. And so after we all have a chance to speak, we'll stand for questions. Something happened to the lights here. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, a mood, it's mood lighting now, huh? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming and hearing about what we think is really a critical issue for uh, everybody in Minnesota to understand. You know, if there's a major takeaway from me uh, today, it's that you understand that our concern as the uh, Democrats in the Senate continues to be, as it has been in the last two years, the stabilization of the individual market, because the rest of the market has really, uh, uh, under the Affordable Care Act, uh, stabilized and provided so many positive benefits to Minnesotans. So our concern is for a very narrow group of people who are buying an individual insurance product uh, because they don't have an employer covered insurance or they're a solo practitioner and they have to buy an individual product without the benefit of a large group uh, negotiating power. So even within the individual market, uh, a full half of, of that market is eligible for something we call the premium tax credits. And those write down the costs of an individual policy for those members of that market, the individual market. And we've looked at runs for how those premium tax credits are impacting these huge increases, and we see that in most cases, uh, the, in, the cost of that insurance product is equivalent this year as to the cost last year. So what we're talking about as the critical issue for us is those remaining, those who are ineligible for the premium tax credits but have to buy individual policies. And they're paying 50 to 60, 70 percent, 7 percent increases in their rates. While the rest of us 
if you're on Minnesota uh, on uh, the Minnesota public programs or if you're in the in, in the uh, group market small group market or large group market or for those of us who are on Medicare we're not experiencing this at all so we're asking a very small group of people to carry the responsibility for the very illest people and that really is a burden that be, should be shared by all. That's why we believe that the long-term solutions that we recommended last year in the legislature, many of which came out of a bipartisan work group looking at financing for our health care programs in the long term, those, those bills were introduced for long-term stabilization and solution. But those will not help this group in the next year. So we need to initiate an action very quickly that will help write down the costs of this very small group of people who will be paying a, such a large percentage as compared with the rest of the market and write it down in a way that their costs are equivalent to the rest of the market. And we can do that and we can afford to do that. And one of the reasons that we know we can is because the tax bill didn't pass last year. And in that tax bill, uh, there was a strong push from the House for a $45 million tax break to big tobacco. And I can tell you that I would far prefer to use those resources spent on big tobacco to underwrite this very, very distressed and narrow group of persons buying on the individual market, along with some other resources that are available to us. And we can do that early in the session. We can do it as quickly as we possible can, possibly can for the next year while we work together to find long-term solutions. I'm, I'm, I'm also am aware contextually that last year, we really uh, were focusing in terms of conversations with the public on the big bills, the tax bill, the bonding bill, the transportation bill. So less attention was given to the Health and Human Services Policy Committee, where there were significant, the primary objective laid out from the very beginning of the session was the stabilization of the individual market, uh, initiatives to affect the overall cost of health care such as affecting pharmaceutical costs and driving down those, those huge costs in, that are driving up the price of insurance products. And those initiatives uh, didn't get a lot of coverage. So it's not, it's not surprising that uh, because attention wasn't on th those reforms, that the public doesn't know how many, and we've handed out to you, lists of reforms that were moved through the Senate and it made it to the final conference committees, but simply were, we were not able to get them uh, passed out of those conference committees. They were blocked. And these reforms that you see, there are too many for me to list, uh, would have gone a long way to avert, to avert the crisis that we're in right now. But well, now we're in a reactive position, and it's why we need to come together I'm glad to hear from our Republican colleagues some of the same ideas coming forward from them that we proposed last year. It's a good sign that we're, we're able to come together over these longer term solutions. And we need to work together in order to solve those. But we also need to do something in the short term for those who will be paying high premiums during the next year. Another factor that's influenced this that Governor Dayton talked about in his press conference that I don't think people really understood from the coverage is the partnership that's needed with the federal government. The Affordable Care Act that the Democrats passed at the federal level and that we have been trying to implement at the state level was a very different product than what we're seeing right now. And what's different now from what the Democrats passed at the federal level uh, is the, the slicing away at the funding stream for the high-risk corridors. This would have been federal money that came into the state to underwrite these insurance companies who are taking on high-risk patients now that we have everybody covered, nobody can be turned away, and no caps on their insurance. So the federal government provided for that by uh, providing money for high-risk corridors that were cut recently by the federal, uh, by, the, by Congress in order uh, through the negotiations to keep the government from shutting down. We need to implore Congress very early in the next session to go back and restore that funding because it's a major contributor to why 
the individual market is distressed at this time. So that in combination with all the other increasing rates of cost of health care have really distressed the individual market. And then I think uh, I'll let uh, Senator Hayden begin some of his comments, but I wanted to talk uh, briefly before giving it up about the Minnesota Insurance Exchange because I think the public is terribly confused about the Minnesota Insurance Exchange and the Affordable Care Act. Oftentimes you hear people saying that it's the MNsure or the Minnesota Insurance Exchange that is driving this problem. The Minnesota Insurance Exchange is simply a website upon which people can shop and compare. To say that MNsure is driving the cost of health care would be the same as saying that the website for buying airline tickets is driving the cost of airline tickets. The airlines are driving the cost of the airline tickets. They're setting the prices and selling them on the, uh, the website. The insurance companies are saying what they need for you to buy that health insurance product and offering it on Minsure. So suggestions that we should eliminate Minsure as a way of solving the escalating cost of health care is so blatantly uninformed that we really need help in informing the public that that action does nothing to change the trajectory of health care costs or the costs that they're paying in their health insurance products. What it does do is force us into a federal exchange. Eliminating the state exchange forces us into a federal exchange. And what happens if we do that? We lose local control. We should not lose local control over those federal dollars that come in premium tax credits because we can use those to help underwrite our Minnesota care program and we can use those to help our Minnesota persons buy down the cost of their health insurance. Another concern that you hear people say is we ought to go back to MCHA. This was the Minnesota Comprehensive Health Program. We'll hear that as the solution to this problem. That's also terribly uninformed. It ignores, it makes a myth out of the old program, as if that program was continuing to be affordable. This was a very high risk pool. People didn't go in it until they were already very sick. They'd been kicked out of their insurance plan because they met their caps or they were changing jobs and the insurance company wouldn't cover them anymore. So here's a group that we know already is very expensive. Their premiums were very high and we subsidized it on tobacco tax and a, and a tax on the insurance companies and a few other, uh, a, a other funding streams. All Minnesota dollars to underwrite these very sick people. What the Affordable Care Act did for us is give us premium tax credits, money that comes from all over the United States. We pay a lot of money into the federal government. It's about time Minnesota got that money back in premium tax credits that we can use to underwrite the very ill people that are in this individual market and buying, buying their products on the Minnesota Insurance Exchange. So we traded the, Min the Minsure program for premium tax credits. It funds the same thing, it underwrites the costs of these products, and assists us in being able to write down the cost to these very ill people. So to step back just a moment, I want to remind you that what we are about and have been with a number of reforms all listed in handouts for you. We had those in place, ready to act on earlier. We're glad to see our Republican colleagues begin to articulate interest in some of those and be able to come to the table for these long-term solutions. For the individual market, it's important to stay focused that the rest of the market is quite well stabilized. And also that uh, the Democrats are, in, are really serious about a short-term fix for those people now, those in the individual market that cannot get premium tax credits that are paying 50 to 70, 67% increases, that we give them a break in the next year until the Republicans and the Democrats and the legislature can come together and sort of hammer out a solution to this problem. Well, um, I'm not sure what else we can say because my, my chairs have done an excellent job at articulating uh, kind of the point contextually what uh, we have done, what the DFL uh, Senate has proposed, uh, the reasons why I think that they've been articulate. And the only kind of thing, you guys got some handouts that I thought were done very well that just really spoke to this issue of, you know, what my uh, good friends, uh, 
uh, in the Republican Party have said that they wanted to do, and the reality of, like, Senator Abler here, and the reality of that the DFL has proposed those. <laughs> that those things have been proposed, that those things were on the table, uh, that we were ready to act on this issue. Uh, they were, uh, they came, uh, some of them were our ideas, some of them were national best practices, a lot of them came from the healthcare uh, financing task force, and we were well re ready and prepared uh, to deal with this issue. You saw the variables and the fluidness of this, but if we would have been able to at least have the conversation in the conference committee across from our House Republican colleagues, I think that we would be much farther along. The fact is, and the reality, is that much like my, the, my, the, the U.S. Congress and the Republican leadership there, which I think I just read something that one of my uh, staff gave me. I think it's over 60 uh, uh, proposals to repeal or reduce the ACA and a number of, of just full out repeals. That has been the focus, unfortunately, of Republicans here in the legislature. So as, a, as opposed to fixing and, and evolving and figuring out what we should do for the folks that Senator Sharon and Lori have told you about those that you're hearing from, what we were focused on was the ideological driven process of repealing the ACA for political purposes. And that is a problem. So I am happy uh, that now uh, my friends uh, to the right uh, want to sit down and figure out how do we walk through this issue. I'm uh, ecstatic that I've seen all of this press conferences and, 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 and releases and research that says this is what they want to do. I think that that is fantastic. But unfortunately, the time to have done that to really affect, and now we're going to try to do things uh, here in the next couple of months, uh, but the time to really have done this work uh, to make sure that we didn't get ourselves in this predicament was during the legislative session. That's when people expect for us to do our job. I personally feel that the DFL Senate proposals led by Senator Sharon, or Senator Sharon, Senator Lori, I don't know where they are, uh, people like myself uh, that have been on the task force move those forward. Uh, they were bipartisan recommendations. We went over that at nauseum and move those things forward to try to deal with this issue. And they were met with the same ideological no, we don't like it. Let's go to the federal exchange. Let's dismantle it. Let's put this old, this, this burden on Minshore until we can dismantle it. But whatever it was, it was really about dismantling Minshore because that's what I've heard from the very beginning when we started to talk about the Affordable Care Act. So with that, I think that you guys can look at it. We can, you know, clearly take questions. I think that we have a strong team. We want to get to work. We understand the urgency of this. We've understood the urgency of this uh, for quite some time. Now, <clears throat> I am glad that we can uh, continue. I'm glad that the governor is at the attention of the governor and that we can sit down and work extremely hard uh, to figure out solutions uh, so that people can get affordable, so people can get covered, and hopefully they can get covered in the places in which they have uh, relationships with their physicians, and it can be at some level affordable to them. Thank you. So, I came late to this, but uh, did you talk about the uh, House Democrats' plan to use tobacco tax? Uh, I didn't talk about the yeah, yeah. House Democrats' plan. I, you know, I think that 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 would be a short-term solution that we should absolutely consider. I mean, I think as Senator Sharon hammered home and Senator Hayden as well, we are in a position where we have a group of individuals that are going to be facing um, too large uh, increases and too high a price for the health care that they have. And so I think that's in keeping with um, some of the things that that the Republican Senate put forward in terms of tax proposals to try to help this, tax um, subsidies. It's also in keeping with a, a bill that we ran through the Minnesota Senate last year as well, you know, trying to uh, provide subsidies above 400% for that slice that is not able to gain access to um, the subsidies from the federal level. I'm, we've recognized for some time that that really has become uh, too large a burden. And, and uh, we are, you know, one of the things that sets Minnesota apart from most other states in the country is our willingness to put state revenues into and invest in the health of our people and our communities. And when we see a population struggling to afford 
you know, to have access to quality, affordable health care, we step in and we do it together. And I think that, you know, um, given what I've heard uh, since uh, from all of the caucuses, since um, the, the rates have been finally released and, and we've seen what the uh, market is going to look like in 2017, I, I think that we are up to the challenge and I think that uh, what the House put on the table um, should get serious consideration, but it needs to be put in the context that that would likely be a short-term solution and we need uh, longer-term solutions that provide longer-term stability to a marketplace and um, start to really work on additional levers to change the care delivery system and make sure that we are using our um, health care resources in a, in, a, in a wiser fashion. What about the question of timing? When can this wait till regular session and you support a special session after the election? You know, if we can get together and get the caucuses together, um, you know, I, I think the governor was right. It, it, we're going to have to decide that after the election, which is, what, three, three and a half weeks away. Um, I, I think it's too much of a stretch to try to get that done ahead of the election. That said, I'm having some conversations, you know, uh, trading phone calls and texts with some of our colleagues, you know, um, on, on our side of the aisle and, and across the aisle to see if we can figure out some things that uh, we could do, no matter who's in charge, you know, truthfully. Uh, whichever of us come back, we're going to have to own this. And I think that if we can find something that can work and that can be that short-term solution to try to find that financial uh, fix for t the 2017 marketplace, I think that we should do it. And I think we should do it ahead of the session. But but keep in mind, it you know the the long-term piece too. Even if we fix the financial piece, we're not fixing the network piece and the, uh, the access to the provider communities across the state of Minnesota. And so we, we are still in need of, of more work at the well, legislature. Framework, governors have always insisted on a deal ahead of time, all four caucus leaders signing off. Is this big enough and needs enough brainstorming that you come in and work on it, or does it all have to be worked out, come in, pass a simple bill? Well, you know, maybe I'll ask uh, my leadership person at the, at the thing here to... Well, well, I, I, I would think that this is just a little different than what we've normally done. You know, the governor has called for and we agree to put the health care financing task force, or, or it's still together, but to, for it to, I think I saw a note from the commissioner saying that she wanted us to come back together. Um, so we want to do that. I think I agree even with, you know... Um, uh, Senator Benson, uh, uh, you know, I know sometimes we don't agree, but this we agree upon. We really need to work on this issue. So this, m different than coming together with some things that have already been heard and we just have to pick and, pick and choose, I think this demands a different level of um, input. We want to hear from our stakeholders. Surely we want to hear from the public. We want to hear from the plans. Uh, we want to hear from uh, the health care uh, members. In or outside of the special sessions that work that can happen? Well, I, I don't know the, the, the mechanisms, uh, you know, of that. I, I, you know, I guess you'd have to ask the governor because he would, you know, he always is the one that kind of says what are the terms in which he wants. So if we do it in and we come to an agreement or if we do it outside of, I don't think that we could do it how we normally would, which is to kind of meet in that room that you guys find us and hammer it out. I think it's a much uh, bigger group of people that would have to kind of vet these. We, we really are, are, want to make sure that we look for the unintended consequences. This is an unintended consequence. So we don't want to kind of mirror that, or we at least want to have that in front of us as we talk about it. I, I would want to make sure that really smart people who, who do this work from multiple vantage points, we, you know, the Department of Commerce is involved with this. You know, of course, you know, we're, we're, we're really focused on the healthcare aspect. So I think it would have to take just a little bit of time, even if it was a marathon uh, session, to come up with a set of recommendations that then maybe the governor and the leaders could look at and agree upon. You know, the people that need help are going to need the help in January where they have to begin paying their 2017 premiums. Mm -hmm. Can you afford to wait until the regular session starts? And if you waited, how long would it take for the tax credit assistance or whatever to kick in? I mean, would it be June before these folks get help? Would they have to wait till the following year when they got tax rebates? Because they can't wait that long. Well, I'm going to let Senator Sharon jump in on that, but I, I, we, we understand the urgency. But you, you still have to be able to take enough time to be able to do it right. So we do understand the urgency, and I'm not saying that this would, 
go on forever, but we do want to make sure that we do it right instead of creating another hill that we have. But thanks for sharing it. Yeah, yeah thank you uh, for that question. Um, Remember, open enrollment starting here November 1st, so people are going to be purchasing and then they are paying a monthly premium. So it's not like the whole thing is paid right away. No, they, start paying in they start paying, they start paying, yes. and very high premiums. So the danger, the danger if we do not act quickly, whether it's in a special session or right away on the front end of the session, with a proposal that gets money back into the pockets of the purchaser, so that they do not have, so that they have the money to pay for this premium without it coming out of pocket is critical. I believe that we have the money in place to be able to do it because we didn't spend 40 million given a tax break to big tobacco. And there are other resources there that we can use for a year at least until we figure out what we're gonna do in the long term to stabilize this market. Help the very people you're talking about. Half of those in the individual market that don't get premium tax credits, that's so, critically important. So I believe we can do that rapidly, whether it's a special session or right away in the beginning, because we have the resources, and I think both Republicans and Democrats see that this very short-term, very small group of people are paying an extraordinary price, while the rest of us are not sharing in the pain. So using statewide tax dollars to ease this for this group of people is fair. It's the right thing to do, and it's hard to make any arguments against that. Senator Turner, how about yes. this, the one Republican proposal to allow people who don't buy uh, individual uh, policies through Minsure, but buy from, directly from a broker and agent, allow them to somehow uh, qualify for the ACA discounts or ACA subsidies? Is that would that take a waiver from the federal government, or is that something that's doable? Well, I, I don't think it doesn't do one blessed thing. It doesn't do a blessed thing to take down the cost of health care or health insurance. It just says that an agent can uh, sell their product and have access to those. So it, it is a, su a suggestion that the insurance industry and the insurance agents who don't want competition from another portal to be able to provide uh, uh, this tax credit benefits has nothing to do with what it is that would help us and help these individuals write down the cost of their health insurance. And why we want to stay focused on that is because individuals who are going to be purchasing starting in November and payments in January are going to be, it's a very small group of people, but when they look at those prices, they might consider not purchasing health insurance at all. And the consequence of that you know, take take the you know the penalty instead of because the penalty might be less than the uh, copay that they have to pay or less than the their share of the premium, the upfront cost. The problem with that is they really we by not helping them put them at risk of bankruptcy because it just takes one or two or three incidences to really throw people into crisis. For those on the healthy end and are younger. They might have a chance to recover from that, but it really takes them out of economic their economic future. And for those at the end, just before Medicare, they're really risking their retirement. So it's really important. The risk to this group of people, that if they take that choice to not buy health insurance is so substantial and so unfair when we could very quickly address the issue that is in front of us, the critical issue, that's in front of us, which is this group of people who can't get premium tax credits who are paying 50 to 67 percent more as opposed to all the rest of us in the state. The number is very small, disproportionately paying a burden as compared to the rest of the state. It seems like well, spoke of the Republican and then none of them have gone through Minsure. They'd all bought their insurance from brokers. So. Well, and, and well, to, your, to, to, that. <laughs> to your last to your last question, um, yes, absolutely, it would take a federal waiver to allow the credits to flow for per, for uh, products purchased off exchange, and it's important to note that that that's one that we actually agreed to instruct our administration to apply for that waiver, and they have been told that that the feds are not interested in that right now in this transition period. So I mean, we actually worked with our Republican colleagues and passed a bill in, I think, 2015 that instructed the agency to apply for that very waiver. Um, and, and that's not going to help 2017. And even if we were able to get um, the tax credits for those people eligible for the tax credits that, uh, to flow for off-exchange purchases, 
Um, it still wouldn't help the group that we're talking about that are above the 400% threshold and just ineligible for taxes mm -hmm. regardless. That's the folks that are really exposed and that we really need to pay, you know, to keep our focus on. So if you're under that 400%, you do have an avenue to gain access to the subsidies to buy down the monthly cost of your premiums. If you're above that threshold, we take it seriously. We need to focus on that, you know, set of individuals and really try to provide that financial assistance. Can I just, may I just add one more yeah, thing? Because okay. this is an important question. Uh, you know, we, I was asking for some information. Uh, for people who do not buy their health insurance on the exchange as opposed to buying it outside of the exchange, there is a number, there's, there's about an estimated eligibility for tax credits of about 82,000 people. In the individual market is about, uh, just it's two th uh, 280,000, about 82,000 eligible for tax credits. But a third of those are not applying for them or using them. And that, that is a problem of people not buying. Uh, I don't know if it's because they got so frustrated in the beginning days with the exchange, which is now operating better, or if when they go to their insurance agent, they're not guided to take a look at uh, premium tax credits. But it's clear that we need to assist people to get to the exchange because many people who are buying individual policies now are eligible for those credits and they are not, they are not uh, getting them. You're leaving money on the table. I just have a question for all of you. Uh, don't you think that the tone needs to change here between Republicans and Democrats? Because here in this press conference I hear, well, we had these things on the table before and they didn't let us go through. And then I hear the Republicans say, well, you know, uh, they are the ones who wanted the ACA. You know, I, I feel that doesn't it need to change the blame yes. to work, especially if you want to work together? Well, I, I, I would suggest that in, in my comments, though I talked about the reality, what happened, because uh, I think that that's important for you to know, but I think that you've heard each and every one of us say that we understand the issue, um, we understand the complexity of the issue, um, and we're looking for solutions. So through the Healthcare Innovation Task, Federal ta or Financing Task Force, through great ideas that may come from um, the the leadership uh, in the House um, that they talked about, that we outlined, that we had already kind of ran that through our process uh, to ideas that may come, um, you know, um, from Senator uh, Abler, who I know uh, I've served with him enough to know he's got some great ideas. And in, in his mind, we do want to hear that. We do want to fix that. But we thought it was important because in, in, in press conferences before, there was this kind of shift this tone that I've been able to see that here was all of these ideas and amendments that we didn't accept and now we have it. We must let Minnesotans know what the record was and yes, we are willing to work right now when we leave here until uh, we until we find a solution to figure it out. We are in this kind of small window now where a lot of members are out talking to their constituents about, you know, going through their job interview, if you will, and talking about what they've done uh, or what they need to do to get back. So we're trying to figure that out. But we talk about this. We work through this issue. Um, I think that it, I can speak of the DFL Senate Healthcare Caucus, which has always had, since I've been around, Senator Rosen as part of our conference committee. We have worked in a very bipartisan way. Back to the timeline. Uh, Let me just add so. one thing to that, because your question is, shouldn't we get off of blaming and get on to solutions? We absolutely agree with that. Uh, but we, we get put behind the eight ball, and I, I, ju I just make it's very difficult during an election cycle when something like this allows for partisan kind of statements of, and inaccuracies. And it's impossible for us to have, to hear in a Republican press conference that we that the Democrats have not lifted their hand to do one blessed thing, have not lifted their hand to do one blessed thing to address this. That was said. And that's why we have to ask you to fact check that. And that's why we're presenting facts today, that that is inaccurate, that's not true. The truth is a number of initiatives were initiated last year, got to our conference committee and were rejected. That would have helped avert the problem that exists today. And the other truth that you need to fact check is that the Affordable Care Act that was supported is not the Affordable Care Act that we're dealing with today because the Congress has withdrawn money that was given to the insurance companies to underwrite the cost of these high risk population, the very sick. So that context, even though you may not want us to go back over that, 
we have to have people understand the truth of the environment that we're in. And I, I for one, would avoid, like to avoid going over that. But when I hear, especially as the chair of the Health Policy Committee, a member of that committee say we didn't lift one hand as Democrats to re uh, reform this, uh, that's blatantly inaccurate. And, uh, and, and it forces me to have to at least say that uh, that's inaccurate because it, it's a smear on, on me and on the work that we did in the Senate. You know, we hear, we hear, we hear the same stuff all the time. We, we come in here and we hear you guys complain about the Republicans. We go in there, we hear them complain about the Democrats. And I look at this thing right here that you guys just proposed. It's a Band-Aid. We're going to be back here in a year because some other group of people are going to get screwed over. And they're going to be paying more money or whatever. You know, um, I just, I talked to four different people. They don't even know each other <coughs> this last week. And they're choosing to take the penalty because they can't afford it. I mean, you guys got to work together. So d did you, was that a question? No, I, I, saw the <laughs> I didn't know if you were making a statement and, and you wanted to come here or did you want us to, well, no, to I mean, respond I mean, to that? You, you guys... No, I'm serious. I, I just didn't, I was trying to find it. So we'll, we'll reiterate again. We really feel like we have brought together, we have brought solutions that we have went through our process, so we have a process here, has gone through the committees and got to the conference committee. For those who don't know, that's the place in which we take our ideas and we put them up against whoever is leading the other uh, bodies caucus on this issue. We did that. What, what I'm trying to say to you is, I don't know how much more that we can do to put solutions, not saying that those things are gonna go into law or that they were gonna work, but to go through this process if in return, if you and I are having a conversation and I say, what, what's your name? Todd. Todd. I say, Todd, let me tell you the 10 things I'd like to do. And you said, Jeff, I don't want to do any of them. I don't even want to talk about it. I just want it to go away. That, that from our perspective, now there may be different, that is what we thought that we were doing. So what we tried to illustrate is not simply just a blame game, but it was just to say, here are all of the ideas that we want. There was something that I saw about a bill that we had that Senator Schmidt had mm -hmm. that Representative Davis was the, co was, was the chief author and he's the chair of the tax committee and didn't hear the bill. He's in control of that. He can hear whatever bill that he wants. Representative Davis is a friend of mine, so I'm, this isn't like some, you know, scrap. I don't dislike him, but for whatever reason, and I'm not privy to those decisions, they didn't want to hear them, even though they had the ability to move the idea forward. Senator Lori, Senator Sharon, who are in charge of our, uh, uh, in charge of those committees and, and, and say what bills are heard, or at least select them, move those things forward, and the House side, they chose not to do it. I don't know why, but I am ecstatic that they want to move them now. And that's where maybe we should go, as opposed to going backwards, let's move forward Let's look at the sense of urgency and let's start working on those deals. That's what we're here to really articulate um, and to set the record straight. On the timeline, Speaker Dowd says even waiting until after the election, you pointed out, it's only a few weeks away, but he says it's not even appropriate to be campaigning as so many people are having you know, great anxiety about how they're going to make their ends meet and that somebody needs to start working on something hey. immediately. Do you, what's your reaction Mr. to that? Speaker, right there. I'm glad, I'm glad you came. Good to see you, Curtis. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not quite sure if Curtis is ready to go tell every single member, come off the campaign trail and come to the Capitol and we do the same. I just don't know if that's a reality in this time. What I do know is that the folks that have been the leadership in the health care uh, and the folks that are in leadership are really concerned about this issue and are having these conversations as much as they can to tee up this conversation in order to get things done. But we do have interest. We have the, the, the plans and we have healthcare economists and the administration, commerce and the Department of Health and their healthcare economists. There are a lot of folks that have interest in this issue and we have to come together. So we want to do it. I assure you that we're talking about it. My plan today was not to put on my festive Halloween shirt and come in to talk to you guys, but that's what we needed to do in order to start to get ourselves in a place that we can fix the immediacy and the urgency of the issue. Okay. Thank you. Hear, we heard a, a lot about ideas to address costs and then, you know, some more about long-term stability of the market, but I didn't hear much about kind of improving some of the access questions short-term. 
Um, do you have anything in mind, especially, you know, your, your part of the state is where this is probably most severe? Yeah, um, you know, in greater Minnesota, this is this access issue, that's why I brought it up several times. You know, for 2017, you know, I don't really know that we have a great set of solutions to provide access to the networks that people have built relationships with. I find that um, very unfortunate, but most of that degradation occurred after we left session. So, you know, Blue Cross's exit, you know, from the market happened after we left. And, you know, we really didn't foresee that coming. They had the broadest networks. They were about 40% of the marketplace, and they pulled the rug out from under that 103,000 individuals who, rely, who actually selected a product because of the network that was provided and, and some unique services built into the Blue Cross product. Now, I mean, they're, they're not without some arguments about how they got in a position in the marketplace that was a disadvantageous position for them, but they really owed it to their enrollees to come to the legislature and actually try to fix some of these underlying problems uh, with real proposals. Some of them, you know, uh, were actually uh, kind of mentioned in Governor Dayton's uh, comments a couple of days ago. He was, uh, I believe, I'm not going to put words in his mouth, but I believe he was talking about starting to address some of the Minnesota specific guaranteed renewability issues for those of you who, you know, track these things. Um, you know, that's something that, that, we, that also should be on the table in terms of trying to encourage a broader set of people to come forward. The other one is, you know, Senator Sharon's making Minnesota care an option for people. And I think that particularly in greater Minnesota, Minnesota Care has um, really good networks that actually allow people the ability to go see the providers of their choice, the providers that they have a long-standing existing relationship with. And I think that working to try to make sure, at least in those areas where there is no choice but a Blue Plus narrow network product, people ought to be given the choice to purchase a Minnesota Care product um, that is not even subsidized was the proposal that we had. I think we need, we're going to need to work with the feds. Um, we're going to need to have um, a cooperative um, administration to help us make sure that we're not losing out on federal funding opportunities to support this. But I think that is really one of the key ways that we're going to work toward um, making sure that people have choice. That is one of the three pillars of our healthcare system is that people can gain access to those providers that, that they're comfortable with and that they've built relationships with. Is that associated with the Minnesota Care uh, legislation that you proposed? Would you, would you ask that again? Was there a fiscal note associated with the Minnesota Care legislation that you proposed or can you give us some ballpark estimate of how much that might cost? Uh, there was not a fiscal note associated with it because what, uh, in order for us to be able to make this, uh, what, let me back up and see what the, what the proposal was. It was to allow for a premium, for a full cost, not at the expense of the taxpayers, but for people to be able to buy it like they would any individual product, Minnesota Care. And uh, it would allow for a broader provider network and be rated across the state, so it's a larger geographic rating. And uh, your question was, what was, would the cost of this program be? What the legislation was, was to allow us to apply for a waiver at the federal level so that we could do this and use premium tax credits to write down for those in that market that would be eligible under the current system to purchase the Minnesota Care product. And if they would allow us to do that, then, the, then we could do a proper fiscal analysis and that waiver request was blocked, so we have delayed our ability to even pursue this, uh, which, which if, if we had gotten that waiver, it would still have had to come back to the legislature for full fiscal analysis and debate through the committees in the legislature. So what, it was the first step of moving forward with a waiver to see if it would be possible for us to do this, to have a geographic rating statewide, and to use premium tax credits to write it down. <coughs> and as soon as we got that, we would come back to the legislature and have a full disclosure and for, for, full dialogue about that would that would help us achieve this. You said the waiver was blocked. You blocked it. When did well, that it was in the conference committee bill that uh, the Senate brought to the conference table at the end of the session. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good while you're all here.
thought I'd not throw a few thoughts if you thought. Let me, let me get off the way before you. Oh, I might be over here. <laughs> you want to be my partner. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate uh, you sitting here for a minute longer. Oh, over here. Uh, I want to point out this 5% is not just a small group of people. These are my neighbors. These are the people on Main Street. These are the hardware store owners. These are the farmers. These are the people who did everything right. They didn't do anything wrong. They, they bought their insurance from their guy. They just they provide 3.2 jobs. And they are in harm's way. I met a woman last night. Her premiums are going up to $18,000 $18, a year, and her a deductible is $13,500. And she had breast cancer. So she's going to spend $31,500 before she gets, $33,000, before she gets to her first dollar of coverage. What is she supposed to do? And these stories are endless. This is not a small group. This is a major group of the small business Main Street, Minnesota. It's not an outlier, just so you understand that. And I really enjoy working with my colleagues here. I, I, was, I with many of my colleagues, have been eager to work together. Um, and it's t difficult in a partisan world because you're often t not given even a, the deference. And I'm going to spend no time being political. So to tell you this list here, uh, my research team looked at this. None of these even came to the Senate floor of these particular bills this time, just so you know. Uh, but so if we do the little uh, subsidy thing, the rebate, which if that's all we can get done, I'm in. But what's not going to happen is uh, the, the caps stay there. Health Partner still denies people the chance to get injured in Florida and go to a doctor if they have a heart attack. They have to pay cash in Florida. Really? Uh, Blue Cross's network and the uh, Blue Plus network is horrible. And it doesn't include hardly any place that people want to go. And so those things don't get resolved at all. Which is why Senator Re Rep. Representative Hamilton and I called for a special session on November 9th. I suggested to Senator Sharon, my friend, that we were on NPR. I said, call a hearing now. I'll call a hearing. I don't have a chairmanship. But I would call a hearing so we could work on this. These members who, have the, who are the health uh, experts are largely not challenged to any great extent in their races. They could come and start now. Because what has to happen, in my opinion, is we have to change the rules so that we don't allow caps. We bring Blue Cross back as a provider and have them serve in the, the AWARE network, which is everybody's doctors, in a way that's affordable. That will take all the time between now and the end of the year. And we're going to have to engage uh, Senator uh, Klobuchar, Senator Franken, Congressman Emmer, Congressman McCollum to be comrades and go to Secretary Burwell and say, sign this paper. Sign this waiver. We need to fix it all over again. Open up the, uh, uh, the bidding process and help our people. Because even if you give the subsidy, the little rebate of up no more than 10%, you still have an $18,000 deductible for some of these folks. And the story is very considerably, but there's a lot. They still have a lousy network. You still have high out-of-pocket costs. And these people are going to be crushed. And I love my colleagues here. And I'm going to say nothing bad about them at all. And I'm eager to work with them to solve this. I'm eager to go to work tomorrow. I'll take off work. I will, and a lot of my friends and colleagues know this is important. But I'm just relieved they're finally talking about it. Because since we worked on this, a lot of us said, beware what happens. Don't ruin the individual market. Don't have the exchange, fine, but don't wreck everything else. And over the, in the uh, name of serving 7% of the people who will act insurance, we have undone. We've undone these poor folks who count on us. And they're counting on me. The woman last night, she was nearly in tears. What is she going to do? $31,000. They don't have $31,000. And they should buy insurance, but they're going to take the penalty, take their chances. Well, what are they supposed to do? They count on us. So I'm calling on all, of, on all my colleagues and thanking the governor for his attention and using their word special session. This has to happen this year if we're going to make a difference for these networks and these groups. So I could talk all day, but I, I shan't. So thank you. Senator, how do you, how do you just convince Blue Cross to come back after they were posting hundreds of millions of dollars in losses? Oh, it's about reinsurance. The, the issue is that all the people who had the greatest amount of illness got put into the people who were barely sick at all. And we have to address that. Minnesota, Amtra, for all its challenges, actually did work. And just so you know how expensive it was, it was 120% of regular, 20% more. And I will promise you, if you go to all those Amtra clients who bought on the exchange or out, they would love that price again. They would love that. And that's long gone. But that's, we need that something like a reinsurance pool. Complicated, and I would certainly have to work with all my colleagues to figure it out. How about timing if you were God or governor? Would you call a special session immediately? November 9th. 
let's get the politics out of this. We can work on it in the meantime. Senator Sharon's got time, Senator Hayden. Uh, it's too hard to fix to rescue these people. And these are not a, an, a minor part of our group. Thank you very much. Hello. My strategy was just to wait until the Senate was done and then you'd be worn out. We're so. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I'll, I will take a few questions if you like. I, I, you know, this is a really uh, tough situation. Um, obviously, it's a crisis for Minnesota families that are affected by this. And I have spent the last uh, three days uh, out around the state of Minnesota. I was in uh, Red Wing, I was in Wilmer, I was in St. Cloud, and, and then here today uh, holding listening sessions, listening to Minnesotans about how they are being impacted by MNSURE and by the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I do think it was a big step that the governor, um, while many of us would say it's uh, blatantly obvious that the Affordable Care Act is no longer affordable, uh, I do think it was a big step that the governor um, did admit that, the, that, that Minnesotans cannot afford the Affordable Care Act. Um, many Minnesotans are in a, a, a very big crisis um, and, and faced with the choice, do I continue to pay for something that uh, I frankly can't afford or do I make the choice and go without health insurance uh, and, and, and frankly pay a fine to the government for not buying something I can't afford. Uh, and I think that's just a horrible choice. Um, so I think we have to, to work together here in St. Paul to figure out uh, whatever solution we can to help Minnesotans through this crisis. So I'll take questions if you, if you have them. After what has happened at the Capitol for the last two years, why should any Minnesota think that even after the election, if you guys come back in a special session, you guys can do anything that changes this? Well, I, I think, first of all, I don't think we can wait until after the election, and I think it's incredibly insensitive for us to say to Minnesotans, we need you to just pause your lives and pause your worry and your stress worrying about whether you'll have health insurance on January 1st and just wait for a month while we all run through an election here. Um, and, and I better never hear a, a legislator say that uh, in, in this city when, when folks are literally worried about where they're going to get health insurance. Um, we have to work on this. We have to do it now. We have to do it together. There is no other option. Look, I didn't create this problem. In fact, I, I raised every warning flag that I could uh, when Democrats were passing this. Not a single Republican supported it. But the solution to this problem will be bipartisan. It, it must be bipartisan, and we have to solve it together. Um, this isn't a time uh, for placing blame. It's a time for finding solutions. Um, so we're, we're willing to do that. And, and if we wait until after the election to even talk about this, uh, remember that Minnesotans have uh, until December 15th when, when they have to be enrolled for coverage, to have coverage on January 1st. Um, there's also the problem of you've got to take 130,000 people uh, and figure out what to do with them. There's 150,000 that need to fit in 20,000 slots. That leaves 130,000 people without coverage. Um, and we can't do that. Um, and we can't let Minnesotans sit and wait for a month while we campaign. So uh, uh, this is a crisis for them, and I don't think they're going to uh, appreciate anyone who says we're not going to work on this immediately. How do you respond to the statements that were made earlier in the, in the press conference that I wasn't the, the Senate here, so Democrats, I'll, I'll recap yeah, them you. for you. The Senate Democrats said we had you know, various solutions teed up, ready to go, um, such as reinsurance, which Jim Abler has proposed, but that we took it to conference committee and we got nowhere. No, I, I, the, the part of the conference that I was just in here for, and I don't follow everything that goes on in the Senate, but uh, Jim Abler just did stand here and tell you that not one single one of those bills came to the Senate floor of the session. Um, I, I assume that that's correct. I'm going to take his word for it. Bill can come it, to the so. Senate floor and not go to conference committee or vice versa. Uh, What's that? Bill, bill measures can come to conference committee without going to the Senate floor or vice versa. Well, they're not supposed to. They're supposed to pass according to the rules of the, the joint rules of the House and the Senate. They're supposed to pass one body. So I don't think we can stand here today and say that we had real solutions that didn't get voted on on the Senate floor. That's disingenuous, and that's passing the blame to other people. If you have solutions, let's talk about them. If they didn't pass them off the Senate floor or even debate them on the Senate floor, they don't get to say that we put solutions forward and we brought them to conference committee. They can't even get to conference committee without going through the Senate floor. Mr. Speaker, a bipartisan solution doesn't really feel as if it's in the air right now. Well, I'll tell you what, and, and this, I, said it, I said it earlier, um, I think the governor's statement that the, unaffordable care, or the, the Affordable Care Act is no longer affordable 
was a big deal. Um, I think most Minnesotans are saying, yes, Captain Obvious, thanks for your observation, but it's a big deal for him to finally admit that, for him to finally admit that Minnesota families are being hurt by this. So that, I think, clears the way that we can actually put some solutions in place. Um, and, and you know, I know this, the House Democrats proposed today that no one would have to pay more than 10% of their income uh, for health insurance. Uh, uh, that does nothing to fix the problem that Minnesotans are facing right now. Where are we going to put the 130,000 Minnesotans that don't have health insurance on January 1st? The De Senate or the House Democrat solution does not fix that problem. So, and, and, and you know what, frankly, I don't want to have dueling press conferences where we fire ideas at each other. Let's actually all sit together around a table and talk about what the problem is and let's talk about every possible solution. And maybe together we'll, fa we'll find a solution that nobody thought of. Um, instead, what we've got are, are, are politicians that frankly got us into this problem now saying we've got the solution to fix it. And, and what we need to do is go further away from where we were, which worked. Uh, we're in a situation right now that doesn't work. And, and we want to go further and closer towards government-run health care. Minnesotans will reject that resoundly. Um, and, and this isn't a, a situation where we can put a Band-Aid on a shotgun wound. Minnesota families are hurting because of this. And we need to find solutions to help them now. Not after the election and not after January 1st. Now. Are you confident that within the span of the next three months, uh, you know, this, this current legislature can come up with you know, broad health care market reforms that can pass and will work? I wasn't in here for the 50 minutes of the press conference. No, but I, I guess I, you'll have to tell me whether you think there were real ideas and real solutions talked about. If, if that was realistic, I don't know. I wasn't in here. Um, I, I hope that it was. I hope they had some real ideas that, that will help us get to some solutions. There are some creative things out there. Alaska has put in place a, a reinsurance program that um, is taking the risk out of the marketplace. The, the reality is that we need more insurers in the marketplace. Remember when Democrats passed this, they said that Minnesotans were going to save money and they were going to have more choices. Well, I think we know what happened on the money, and today that's what people are talking about, because we need to triage that first. But we can't just deal with that. We also need to give Minnesota the, the Minnesotans the flexibility and the choice and the health care coverage that they need. The only way to get there is to get more companies offering more products in the marketplace. Um, so you talk to insurers, and did they say that if you institute a reinsurance program that, for example, they'll come back into the market? I mean, we have haven't yet. but. That, I think that's what's happening in Alaska, and I think I would, if well, I were you, yeah. yeah. Well, not yet. It, it probably will next year. And I, and I think have it's a long term, but look at where we are right now, and, and I'll make a dire prediction. If we do nothing and sit on this, uh, remember, there was going to be no health insurance offered in the individual marketplace this year. None. None of the companies were going to offer a product. Okay? The only way that, that, that the governor got or the, the administration got those insurance companies to offer a product at all was to agree to caps and to allow them to, to raise the rates uh, 50 to 67 percent. Um, those caps are what the real scary part is for Minnesota families. I mean, it's one thing. I, I, I met a family in Red Wing uh, two days ago. Um, in fact, I think they were, they were featured on one of the news stories recently. Uh, but I met them in Red Wing. They are facing, a th for three people, a mother, a father, and a son, they are facing $3,300 a month premium and a $13,000 deductible. That, I, $3,300 a month for health insurance. My guess their mortgage is probably $1,200 or less. I mean, this is catastrophic. Um, and, and I don't think we can call a health insurance plan that has a $13,000 deductible coverage. I remember when, when uh, Democrats were passing this, one of the reasons they said they wanted to do this was uh, because of the high rate of uncompensated care, which was people without health insurance co going into the emergency room. And, and frankly, we know the emergency room is the, the least effective place to treat most of those ailments and the most expensive. Um, and, and hospitals were taking those high expenses and spreading them on all their other customers. And, and what that was doing is raising the cost of health coverage for everybody. So this was going to solve the problem. Today, the uncompensated care is higher. Why? Not because people don't have health insurance, because they can't afford their deductible. So we can't pretend like, like more Minnesotans have coverage today, because $13,000 deductibles are not health coverage. Minnesota families cannot afford that. But it's all that Democrats have given them. Back on Kyle's question, do you folks who have not been able to come to some different approaches in months and months and months have time for that comprehensive 
retooling. We've really only had a couple of days to work on this problem because it was really only two days ago that Democrats admitted there was a problem when the governor said that the Affordable Care Act was no longer affordable for Minnesotans. Um, now, I, and I, I feel that's a huge step because now I feel like we can roll up our sleeves and get to work. Before it was just us proposing, you know, try, trying to raise red flags and say, hey, this is hurting Minnesota families. Let's put some solutions in place that will work. Um, and, and nothing. But the notion that you patch it with an emergency patch so it buys you many more months to work on a comprehensive retooling, you just don't think that makes any sense? We have to do anything and everything we can, but we can't do that unless we sit together at a table and talk about it. So firing ideas back and forth at each other is, is a, an ineffective way to solve a problem. And Minnesotans need us to be leaders, and they need us to come together and solve the problem. So uh, we're willing to do that. I'll, I'll meet this afternoon, I'll meet tomorrow, I'll meet Sunday, whenever they want, uh, to sit down at the table and talk about what's happening right now to Minnesota families, and what can we immediately do, and what can we do over the long term to find solutions to help them. What they need are more choices and, and affordable choices, and, and that needs to be our goal. Okay, I just want to clarify something yeah. here. It, it seems to me that you're saying that you needed the governor to stipulate that there was a problem with the Affordable Care Act before you began to work on the solutions well, proposed by the bipartisan we've, we've been health care task we've force been last year. Well, I, I'll also take issue with the bipartisan uh, health care task force, and it's a health care financing task force. They didn't look at the problem. All they did was say, we need to put more money into the, into the, the, the situation. They didn't have any reforms. They didn't have anything that would have actually solved the problem. All they did is propose more money. And that's what happens when you put together a health care financing task force. We need help from Minnesotans. Um, and it isn't throwing more money at a failing system. How is putting more money or, or just simply paying the bills that Minnesotans are faced with now going to allow the 130,000 people that will be without health coverage on January 1st to get coverage? It doesn't solve that problem. And, and not to mention the, the dozens of people that I have talked to in the last three days that are being thrown out of their plan and, and thus out of their network and they can't see their doctor that they've seen for years. Uh, that's a problem. And, and none of those Band-Aid solutions do anything to solve that. Now, we may need to do Band-Aid solutions, so I'm, I'm, don't mis misconstrue what I'm saying as being critical of that. Yeah, we do, but we can't just do a Band-Aid. We have to do band-aids and long-term. I'll also, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take an issue a little bit with the, with the administration because we didn't know about this problem until this fall. Um, but they knew that there weren't gonna be any, any insurers in this marketplace earlier this year and they could have raised those red flags. They could have and should have seen this coming. Um, but they didn't engage, they still really haven't engaged us. Um, they're still, I think, trying to get through the election without having to deal with this. And, and it's unfortunate that there is an election, um, but this is an important issue. It's the number one issue we hear about from Minnesotans, and rightfully so. I know that it only affects 5% of Minnesotans, but it scares every Minnesotan because it could be them. Go back and look at tapes of, of what I said in 2016 when the rate increases come out. If you don't think I was raising red flags a year ago and two years ago and three years ago and four years ago, last session. Well, I'll get you a list of all of the things that we introduced and talked about to solve this problem, because we've got a, a, quite a list of them. So any other questions for me? Sounds good. Thank you so much. So with five of those things passed, four didn't. So five of them passed, four didn't, and they were buried in a Commerce Waiver Request. So I'm correcting myself. So five so were passed forward. Yes. Actually, I can get Christian to send you. This is coming.